Welcome everyone to TAG 1-6 webinar, the GMPs and compliance policies your hemp and CBD business may be missing. First of all, I just hope that everyone is healthy, keeping socially distant, supporting one another. And I know it's a very strange time, but with uh, good decision making and innovation, we certainly shall get through this as well. And glad that this is a webinar and not live event so we can run this and just are, are glad that all of you guys can be with us. So we um, first to get started, let's go ahead and meet our guests. I um, want to in introduce you guys to Sheila and Kim. I met um, and was introduced to them through a mutual friend and got together with Sheila and lunch out in Colorado and just hit it off. was really impressed with you know, obviously their approach and their expertise and knowledge. And we realized that there's some really good synergies with their GMP consulting and cannabis and CBD along with our technology services. So first things first, Kim, founder and CEO, tell us a little bit about how you guys got started. Yeah, thank you for the uh, kind introduction and thank you for having us. Um, so yeah, um, we both actually started as a marijuana specialist for DDPHG in Denver um, when it became recreationally legal. So um, I was a restaurant health inspector before, removed a bunch of contaminated um, products from the marketplace when I worked for DDPHG. And that's how a lot of people in Denver um, first knew me. Um, and then since then, I started the company in 2017 to really help the industry instead of just be a regulator. Um, Cause as a regulator, you know, you can't do a whole lot of things to help people. Um, but right. as a consultant, right. you really can. So that, that's kind of what we do. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today. And just real quickly, some of the topics we're going to cover high level, first of all, what are GMPs and how do businesses get started in order to implement them? Maybe a little bit di a difference between um, GMP certification and compliance um, what are the right people to put in place with this? How does it apply for different types of businesses? What are different technologies that can help you? And if you're working with a partner, what do we need to know? So first things first, let's get started with a little poll. I always love polls for whatever reason. So one, let's talk about, are you currently GMP certified? Just to get an idea about who's in the room and where you guys currently are at as an organization. We'll give you guys a second to jump on that, and then we will share the results. So while we're collecting these, Sheila, what is yeah. GMP? So, yeah. So, um, hello, everyone. My name is Sheila. I'm one of the cannabis compliance experts for LA Consulting. Um, and so for GMP, GMP is a big buzzword right now in the industry, especially in the cannabis and CBD side. And so GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practices. Um, if you see the C in front of it, it stands for Current Good Manufacturing Practices. And essentially, GMP is a set of guidelines that the FDA established to ensure that companies are manufacturing safe and quality products. Uh, GMP ensures the quality of drugs, medical devices, supplements, and some types of foods. Um, and really, it's to ensure that you guys have met these marketing claims. It's a proactive approach for quality assurance to minimize risk. And so the FDA developed these GMP standards for all these different manufacturing companies to follow to make sure that they are providing a safe product to consumers. Perfect. And so, Kim... Why is this important, right? If you're, you know, most business owners are certainly focused on developing good products that are desirable to consumers. So you get the product and you have the sale. And this is that in-between portion. Why should a company, CBD and hemp or otherwise, care about good manufacturing practices? Yeah. Um, and just so you know, we do actually help all cannabinoid companies. So including THC with this kind of certification and it is really really important and, and it's really awesome that it's now um, allowed in the industry because it wasn't previously so this is pretty new um, so there aren't that many companies that are actually certified and a lot of people you know say they're certified or think that they're compliant and they're not um, so it's you know it's just kind of a weird world out there but you know it it really 
helps companies, uh, you know, CEOs especially sleep at night. Um, because when you have these processes in place, if you're GMP certified, you're making a product that is consistent and safe constantly. Um, everything is in place. Your employees are trained a certain way. Um, and you know that your product is the highest quality it can possibly be. Um, on top of that, you know, it, it takes away a lot of liability. So if there was an outbreak and things like that, you know, you're, you're GMP certified. Um, it is less likely that the issue came from you. Um, and that's always a great thing. The other thing is, is marketing. So in this industry, when it comes to like FDA and food safety, they're highly unregulated. Um, in fact, most counties and states um, don't even have a health department that visits any of these facilities, uh, THC or CBD or any of them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is a way for you to be compliant with those standards without having to have an outside regulator. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are just thinking, you know, this is a really great idea to do this um, because then also when it becomes federally legal, we're ready for them. Um, if you are GMP certified, you will get through an FDA um, audit without any problems. And it may, they might ask you to change a couple of small things, but they're certainly not going to close you or take your license or any of those terrible things that happens pretty often. So it's a great idea. That, that's that's really good insight. And I think something else that's been popping up a lot in the industry is, hey, listen, this, companies have decisions to make and oftentimes starts with culture on why would they want to go through this process to become GMP certified in addition to state, local, or FDA regulations. But now there's a lot of civil lawsuits popping up that put companies at risk. And those um, civil lawsuits are motivated by something um, much greater, which is money, and they want to be able to get it. They're going to target the larger companies. So there's certainly a lot of reasons, and you mentioned one of them, which is to help your sales too. So uh, you talked a little bit about GMP certification. A lot of companies and people say, hey, I came from a GMP environment. I know how to implement these. Sheila, talk a little bit about the difference between GMP certification and GMP compliance and what this means to different companies. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. And we actually get this question a lot um, with our clients where they say, you know what, we're buying products from a company that says that they're GMP compliant. Is that the same thing as GMP certified? And so I really want to explain and stress to you guys that there is a huge difference between the two. So GMP compliance is stating that your company is following those GMP standards that the FDA has developed. However, anybody can say that they are GMP compliant and there's nobody really auditing them or holding them to those standards. So for a company that's advertising that they're GMP compliant, we don't really know for sure. There's no proof other than what they're, they're saying, what their word is. Now, the difference with GMP certified, in order to be GMP certified, it means that you have to have an accredited certifying body come into your facility conduct an audit and actually pass in order to become GMP certified. This takes an extreme amount of work, a lot of documentation, training of employees. It can be very costly sometimes, um, but this certification will allow you to market it on your website. And not only that, but you'll be able to state that you guys have, you know, you have met these standards because there's a body that came in and has actually inspected you and audited, you, audited your company to make sure that you met those standards. Now, these certifications also have to be um, re-audited every single year. So uh, the certifying body is going to have to come in and make sure that you're upholding those standards and that you're mm -hmm. maintaining your certification. And so one other thing I really want to quickly add is that um, we have also seen companies in the past advertise that the FDA has certified their company or that they are GMP certified through the FDA. Now, the FDA does not certify, nor does any other government body. Even though the FDA came out with these standards, they are not allowed to go in and certify companies or put their stamp of approval on companies, just like any other government company, because that would be immoral. So it's important to understand that it's a red flag if a company is saying that they are certified through the FDA because the FDA does not do that. Um, the FDA can come into your facility and they can conduct an audit and you may even pass that audit, but that does not mean that you are certified. You still have to have an accredited certifying body come in to do that specific certification. Awesome. That's great. So there's a lot that's included in GMP certification. Kim, touch upon 
a handful of those, I guess you'd say, checklist items that are often considered when companies move towards that GMP certification or even compliance for that matter? What are all the things they need to consider? Yeah, well, um, the list of things that you need for documentation for GMP certification is extensive. Um, most, in fact, I've never done a GMP like um, gap analysis, which is like the first audit that we go into and had anyone pass it um, because the documentation alone just takes forever. But these are the other things that I'm going to kind of give a couple of examples of, of you know, these things and, and how they can affect you. But materials, things that you're using in your facility, um, this also covers like what your walls, floors and ceilings are made of, things like that. Premises, you know, just making sure that you're, you know, you have um, a premises, like a facility that actually can uh, make food grade ingredients and food grade mm -hmm. products. Um, so having enough hand sinks, making sure there are no holes in the walls, the ceiling isn't falling in, um, equipment, making sure your equipment is UL listed or things like that. You know, you're not just making an extractor in your garage and then bringing that and making food, you know, food from that. Um, storage, making things where things are off the floor. Um, that's just an easy example because a lot of times people store stuff on the floor and you're not allowed to do that. But just making sure that that's organized and, and clean. Record keeping, um, that really goes into the documentation. So most of the SOPs and documents that are required for GMP will have a lot of, um, you know, records that you have to keep up with. Um, staff training, you do actually have to train your staff and then document that. Um, personal hygiene, just overall personal hygiene of your staff. So, you know, if people are coming in and haven't taken a shower in a week, that's like one of the most uncomfortable conversations as a regulator that I've ever had in my life was you need to shower more. Um, <laughs> it, it has happened, unfortunately. Um, and then handling complaints, you know, when, you know, if you're not handling the product correctly, or you know, it's not um, packaged correctly or something like that, you can get complaints about that and you have to really make sure that you're doing you know, the right thing. Product development, you know, you, a lot of people have to do a lot of R&D um, and that's exciting. So you have to have protocols for that. Recall, hmm. um, if you have to go through a recall, you have to have something and your staff has to be trained on it on how to go through that and who to call and what to do. Um, ingredient sourcing is really big that we'll get into. Testing, obviously, I know that it's not required in the CBD industry yet, um, but the FDA is right around the corner and it will be. But I feel like people should be testing for a lot of things um, anyway, and then making sure your packaging is good. Um, and then traceability, we're going to talk about that a little later. It's clearly a lot. And I think part of, I mean, I'm learning a lot from you guys today. And, and of course, we've had a chance to listen and I think part of this, I mean, granted, we're not going to be able to cover everything in an hour, but it's to make us what I like to say consciously incompetent. Man, now I know that I don't know, and then who can I turn to? So one of those things um, I'd love to hear from you, Sheila, is, you know, you as the, um, you know, in part of the city of Denver, public health, used to go into a lot of different cannabis locations. What are some common mistakes that you often saw and what are some things that we can avoid uh, for everybody who's on on the call today? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, Kim and I both came from working for the health departments and we were cannabis investigators. And unfortunately, we saw a lot of common mistakes that ended up being very costly for these companies. And so I think it's important that we share those common mistakes and that companies can learn from some of the mistakes that we made in Denver and some of the growing pains we had as one of the first states to really legalize cannabis and start, you know, inspecting it. And um, so I think that the first thing I like to mention, and this really relates to GMP certification, especially is purchasing SOPs online. So we had several companies that would purchase SOPs that were GMP certified or GMP compliant, um, these SOPs online, and they would spend thousands and thousands of dollars on these SOPs. And when they got delivered to their facility or when they got them electronically, they would realize that these SOPs have nothing to do with their current process. And they really mm -hmm. couldn't use any of those SOPs because it wasn't specific to their facility and what their specific process was. And so I think right. it's important to note that all of your documentation and all of your SOPs when it comes to G GMP certification 
need to be very specific as to your facility and what you are doing. Um, buying general SOPs online really is not going to help you guys, and they're just going to be a waste of money. And unfortunately, we saw a lot of companies waste a lot of money on, on these type of programs. The second thing is learn how to write an SOP. So we went over, you can't buy all these SOPs online, so it's important to learn how to write them. And there's a lot of classes. You can take webinars. You can even get information from a consultant or hire somebody, but it's important to know how to write SOPs and be able to update your SOPs yourself. Um, and another big thing that we saw a lot was we would have facilities that would have these beautiful SOPs that were 100% GMP compliant and written so beautifully but they were either A, on a shelf collecting dust and nobody had ever read them, no one was trained on them, or B, that they would have these beautiful SOPs, but their actual physical facility was not GMP compliant. And so it's important to remember that GMP certification is going to be not only your documentation, but a large part of that is your physical facility. And so we would see in SOPs, they would be amazing and they would say, you know, employees are trained to wash their hands the moment they walk into the production room. But in reality, their production room didn't even have a hand sink. So it's important that you guys have both sides of those and that your physical location is, is compliant to those standards as well. Um, training employees is another huge issue when it comes to GMP or even FDA compliance that it's important that your employees are trained on food safety, on all of your SOPs, on the safety of equipment, on how to make the product itself, that there's so much that goes into employee training to produce a safe product and have a safe environment within your facility. And it really starts with the training of your employees because everyone needs to be held responsible. Um, unapproved equipment. And so Kim touched on this a little bit, but this is a new industry and everybody and it's evolving so fast and everybody has the latest and greatest of technology and equipment. Um, unfortunately, there were several issues in Denver where we found equipment that wasn't approved. And what I mean by that is it wasn't constructed a food grade material, it wasn't easily cleanable, and it wasn't listed, whether that's UL listed or NSF listed. But if you're in a commercial facility and you're selling products to consumers, you need to have you need to have commercial grade equipment. So it's important that all your equipment that you're bringing in is approved and that there's no wood handles on there that would be porous or things like mm -hmm. that. Um, another thing is unapproved ingredients. And so we're going to go into this a little bit further um, uh, down in the webinar. But I want to touch on this real fast because we had several recalls in Denver based on unapproved ingredients. So it's important to ensure that all of your ingredients in your products are from a licensed and regulated facility and that they're used for their intended use. So what we mean by that is if you have a product that's an ingredient that says that it's for intended use is for topical, then you cannot put it in a food product, that it really should be for a topical product only. Um, the last thing is not tracking all of your ingredients, all of your batches, all of your packaging. Essentially, everything in your facility needs to be tracked. And so we always recommend having a really good inventory tracking system that's going to that's going to track all of your your batches, your ingredients, your packaging, everything in your facility, because when your facility grows, it's a lot to keep track of. And you really need to know where everything is in your facility and what is in your facility. That's really helpful and a lot of information and i think something that i pull from that is it really seems like um that culture is big right that a lot of companies may um and while i'm talking this through i'm going to start another poll too so just give me one second the poll is what part of the gmps and and kim and sheila just touched upon them do you think would be most challenging for your company to implement so go ahead and fill this out but just to carry on that it may be like, all right, well, we're going to write some things up and then we share it. We talk about it in a meeting, then you put it away. Or maybe you have the facility, but not the process. Or as with any company, you're going to have turnover on your staff. That culture is going to be a really big and important part of that, which, of course, gets into the people on your team, which is what we're going to talk about next. So before we get that, let me share with you guys the results of this. What part of GMPs do you think would be most challenging to your company? Give you guys one last second, and then we will share the results. So most of it is a product traceability, an SOP writing and document management, and the least is training staff. So thank you guys, everybody, for sharing that information. 
So quick question for you guys. People matter, right? Whether they're hiring a qualified consultant like you guys are, you, you are certified, you've been doing this for a long time, or hiring a full-time employee. What do you guys, if let's say you're a CEO of a cannabis CBD or hemp company, or somebody comes to you and say, hey, listen, we need to hire somebody or I'm looking for a consultant. What do you guys typically recommend they look for when they're when they're looking for qualified people to support their team? Yeah, so I think that, you know, the cannabis industry um, is very unique and it's still very new. Um, but I do think when you're hiring a consultant that it's important that you find someone within the cannabis space just because it is such a unique um, industry. It's changing all the time, whether it's regulations, state by state. Um, you know, the types of products that are out there. So I really think it's important for um, when looking for a consultant that you find somebody who is educated in the industry. Now, with that said, I would also say that, you know, if you're looking for a full time employee to hire to your facility, it may be hard to have all of your employees with cannabis background just because it is such a new industry. And so I think that there's several other industries that you can pull from um, when you're hiring employees to make sure that they're still a good fit. And an example would be is if you are a cannabis company and you're making cosmetics, whether that's, let's say, CBD, mm -hmm. um, you know, lotion or something like that, you can hire people from the cosmetic industry and they're going to be a great resource for you. Or if you're making, let's say, tinctures or soft gels, hiring somebody from the supplement industry is going to have great knowledge um, as it pertains to, you know, GMP standards for supplements and you know, general regulations when it pertains to supplements. So I think you can still hire a lot of people outside the cannabis industry that are going to have great insights. The one thing I would recommend is that um, make sure it's a good personality fit. A, and not only that, but make sure that they're really dedicated to the industry. And we've seen this several times that because it's an ever changing industry and, you know, we really are kept on our toes in this industry, all of mm -hmm. your employees should really be dedicated to the cannabis space and be ready for those types of changes. And I think the more passion you have for the industry, the better fit you're going to be for working in the industry. Absolutely. And I think that gets into, you know, personality fit, people who can adapt, they're open to new ideas and and, um, you know, fitting in with the team and, of course, having experience. And I think we've run into a couple other industries that have translated pretty well. One, which is food, right? Anything that somebody has to consume is important, as well as pharmaceutical and biotech. We met with one company out in Denver and we met with, I think she was the COO, but she said, when I first met with the COO, I said, you probably don't want to hire me because I'm going to make a lot of changes here. And it's going to be painful. And he pretty much hired her on the spot. And now they just got their GMP certification. So oftentimes that's what it takes to bring the right person on. So real quick, Kim, assume we've got some companies here on the line. They may have the brand. Uh, they have another company white label it for them or use a contract manufacturer. Is this something they need to worry about or Hey, if I could just get some documentation from my contract manufacturers, some C of A's, and they tell me and send me their certification, then I'm off the hook. What are your thoughts about that? Kim, are you there? Can you hear me? Sheila, are you there? Yeah. Yep. I'm here. I can. So I think I might have a connection problem with Kim. Um, but yes, I can touch on this real fast. Right. So yeah. So using a contract manufacturer, we actually see this a lot in the industry, um, whether it's a white labeler or other um, or just someone who's packaging a product after you make it. And I think it's important to note that you are still on the hook, even if somebody else is manufacturing your product, um, that ultimately, if there's going to be a recall or if somebody gets sick, they're going to be calling your company because your company is the label on that product. And so you're still held liable. So it's important to really do your homework here and do your research when it comes to a contract manufacturer. And so what you need to be doing is making sure that that contract manufacturer is held to the same standards that you would expect your facility to be held to, whether that's GMP standards, the employee training, the documentation they keep on site. And what we always recommend to our clients is if you have a contract manufacturer, ask to do an audit of their facility. 
or even have a third party, party auditor conduct an audit at their facility to make sure that they are upheld to the same health and sanitation standards that you would find appropriate. And I think that, you know, right now in the industry, um, we run into issues where sometimes contract manufacturers or white labelers don't want to let people in because mm -hmm. it's proprietary information or they don't want to show their equipment or their secret sauce or whatever it is. But I think that those are huge red flags. And if a company wants to work with you, they should be proud to show their facility. They should be proud to show you how great they are and all of the, you know, education and health and sanitation practices they have to make sure that your product is not going to get recalled and that it's going to be a quality product that is sent to consumers. That's really good to know. We met with one dietary supplement company and they actually were putting cameras up that their, their clients could see in view at any point in time. They really were focused on transparency. So I think you, you've touched upon some things to look for in red flags, but I think it's important for everybody to note, which is if your brand is on the shelf, it's your reputation that's on the line. It's the FDA that will publish your company's name on the warning letters they distribute, which is public information. And you're also liable with a civil lawsuit. So don't assume that just because you're not the one doing the manufacturing that you're not at risk. You're actually at the most risk. And therefore, taking those extra steps can have a huge impact on protecting your company as well as protecting consumers. Yeah, so, so, Kim, are you back? I think she's having some connection issues right now. Um, no so I can, Yeah, I can continue on. Um, while we wait for her to get reconnected, if, if at all possible. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. We've, we've got a built-in contingency plan here. So, uh, Sheila, talk a little bit about ingredient sourcing. And it seems obvious to me that you want to know where your products come from. But, again, what are things that cannabis, CBD companies need to keep in mind when they're sourcing their ingredients and their additives? And what are mistakes that they make? Absolutely. And so this, I think, is a very hot topic. And even from looking at the poll, it looks like this is where people have a majority of their questions. Um, and so for your suppliers, so when you are supplying ingredients for your manufacturing company, you really should be vetting all of your suppliers and not just ingredients, but packaging, equipment, everything. Um, and I know this may sound like obvious, but really all of your suppliers need to be from a licensed and regulated facility. And the reason why we say that is that in Denver, we ran into several issues where, um, you know, facilities were purchasing CBD isolates and realizing down the road that their manufacturer of the CBD isolate was not licensed or not regulated. And so wow. in Denver, that would make that um, ingredient an unapproved source. And part of the issue with that is, you know, Kim had mentioned, not every state is regulating CBD and not every state has a license for these CBD manufacturers. And so they may never have seen a regulator and nobody really knows what's going on there. And so it kind of makes it a tricky industry. But to cover your bases at your facility, you should really be only purchasing product from licensed and regulated facilities. Um, Another thing is food grade ingredients only in consumable products. So we had another big recall in Denver based off of this where a manufacturer was creating a consumable product and they wanted to put some essential oils in their product. Now, I'm not sure if many of you know or not, but some essential oils are food grade and you can 100% consume them and they're made in a food grade facility. However, some essential oils are not food grade and they're only intended for aromatherapy use. And in this particular mm -hmm. case, during their audits, the um, inspector found that these essential oils said on the label that they were for aromatherapy use only. And so this resulted in a recall of all of these consumable products because of the ingredients that was in it that was unapproved. And this could have all been avoided if the manufacturer had really done their homework and done their research to find out that their supplier for these essential oils was not licensed as a food facility and was not approved to make food grade ingredients. So it's really important to be asking the right questions when it comes to your ingredients, to be reading the labels, um, to be making sure that you are asking for an SDS sheet for all of your ingredients. And so that's going to be a safety data sheet. And on that safety data sheet, it should tell you exactly the intended use of that product, the safety of that product and how, you know, the directions of how to use it. So it's important to be collecting all of that information whenever you're getting any ingredients. 
Um, and not just for essential oils, this beef run into the same type of issue with terpenes or flavorings, not all mm -hmm. flavorings are intended for consumption. So make sure that, you know, you're really doing your homework for those. Um, other ingredients. So if you're adding ingredients to a consumable product that aren't necessarily food ingredients, um, whether they're vitamins or caffeine or anything else like that, it really needs to be on the gross list. And so the gross list is generally recognized as safe. And it's a list that the FDA has put together. Um, and you can find this list on the FDA website. So really cross-reference all of your ingredients to that mm -hmm. list. Obviously, right now, CBD is not on that list and cannabis is not on that list. Um, but we hope one day that it will be. Um, and so right now, it's kind of a gray area as it pertains to those ingredients. And then um, I also want to talk about vaping ingredients. So this became a very hot topic during the vape crisis. And I think that it really put at the forefront that we need to be very cognitive about what we're putting in to our vaping ingredients or into our vape products. And, you know, as we know, there's certain studies that have shown that certain ingredients are unsafe in vape products, but there is still a lot of unknowns. And what I mean by that is you can have a food grade cherry flavoring that is completely fine to consume or ingest it in a food, but we don't know what happens when you inhale that flavoring or if you combust it and inhale it. Does it change chemically? Is it safe then? So just be aware of those type of um, those type of questions and those, you know, be aware of your ingredients and try to be at the forefront of any type of issues before something like the vape crisis happens because you don't want your company to be a victim of those type of recalls or a negative media. And the last thing when it comes to ingredient sourcing is to obtain a COA with all ingredients. So a COA is a certificate of um, analysis. And so you should be accepting or you should be asking for that with all of your deliveries of ingredients. And to meet GMP standards, you should be taking a sample of all of your ingredients and sending it to a third party lab to test to make sure that it matches that COA. So taking it one step further that you're not just trusting the COA and the safety of that product, but you're actually taking a sample and testing it yourself. And the reason why a, this is part of GMP compliance, but not only that, but we have seen several fake COAs in this industry where wow. people create fake COAs for their CBD or CBG oil to make it seem like, you know, that they have a, a higher potency or no pesticides or heavy metals or whatever it is. So it's important to be double checking because once you put that ingredient in your product, you are now held liable for it. So you really want to be covering your bases. That's great. And a lot of information. So we're going to get into traceability next and some technologies that can support traceability really quick for everybody. We're going to ask another quick question. So why do you think traceability is important in the CBD industry? And we will give you guys a second to answer that. And, and while people are responding to this, I'll just give you guys a quick quote from Frank Giannis. And Frank is a deputy director of the FDA. I had a chance to speak with their team a couple of weeks ago. But a quote of his was, I think end-to-end -end traceability is inevitable. I think the idea of a world in the future where foods cannot be tracked and traced is not realistic. The food system will become end-to-end -end digitized, which I thought was interesting because we know that we're innovating in the space to develop traceability in an integrated supply chain, but was a little bit um, pleasantly surprised to see that there are some people at the FDA who are really moving forward in order to push tech traceability. And there's some limitations what they require as a government organization, but I thought that was pretty interesting. So real quick on, on your side, um, Sheila, at a high level, what are your thoughts about integrating or having an integrated supply chain and having traceability and why it's important specifically to the CB, CBD and cannabis sector of knowing where all your products come from? Yeah, um, no, I think it's extremely important. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, traceability is being able to take your product and trace it back to all the ingredients, where those ingredients come from, the lot numbers of those ingredients, and then also being able to trace it forward as to where your products ended up going. And so this is extremely important in any manufacturing company, um, especially when it relates to recalls. And so the example that I like to use is let's say that you are a manufacturing company and you're purchasing CBD isolate to put in your tincture. 
Um, if your manufacturer calls you one day and says, hey, you know what? The lot number for CBD isolate, that's one, two, three, is being recalled due to contamination issues. You need to recall all of your products that have that specific lot number of CBD isolates. If you are unable to identify what specific products and what specific batches have that lot number of CBD, your regulators are going to assume that it could be in any of your products. And so a recall that may start out as a small recall of just a portion of your products is now going to be an any and all recall. Um, that's what we call it in the industry. And that means anything that was ever produced at your facility is now being recalled. And so it goes from being a small financial burden to a huge financial burden. And when there's recalls at that magnitude, you best bet that the media is going to jump on it and that there's going to be not only a huge cost to your facility as it pertains to the products that are recalled, but also the aftermath of losing trust in your customers and having to deal with the negative media of your company's logo being all over um, the television due to a huge recall. So it's important to be able to trace and track all of your products and be able to identify um, each of those ingredients and be you know, really tracking all of that information. That's really well put. And so what I find is one of the most beautiful aspects of CBD is being that it is a natural product, right? It's naturally grown. There's a lot of um, prospective health benefits for it, which is why it's really um, grown and, and you know people are anticipating to be a multi-billion dollar industry, $25 billion industry by 2025. There's a lot of data around that. But along with the fact that it's naturally grown comes a lot of complexities and that in every phase, and I think this graphic illustrates it well, we have to capture a lot of data and information that ideally is passed a little bit further upstream so that people know the traceability of their product, but it's hard to do. So Kim, I, I think you're back. You know, how, when you guys go in and, and work with companies to integrate GMP processes and procedures, you know, where are people storing all this data? Do they have their own systems? Do they have spreadsheets? And maybe what are some, some tips around tracking certain it, tracking information internally? Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? All good. Welcome back. Oh, good. <laughs> For some reason, it <laughs> me out. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, it kind of depends on the company and it kind of depends on where they're at. So, you know, we work with really, really big companies and we work with really, really small companies. And, you know, there are softwares out there um, that people can use, but they're sometimes really expensive. Um, there's some new ones coming out that are less expensive. Um, we do have people that just use an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of everything. Um, and, you know, that works um, on a smaller scale. Um, and as long as someone is designated to that spreadsheet and is constantly, constantly updating it, it can it can work. Um, but it just kind of depends. And having that real batch number system and understanding, you know, every ingredient that's gone into this, where it came from, what that batch number is. Um, is really, really important because a lot of times it's not the product that you're making in your facility that gets recalled. It's something that was before you, you know, an ingredient flour had salmonella in it. I mean, stuff like that happens all the time. Um, you know, we did one in Denver um, for allergens. So the flour company, they were making brownies, right? And the flour company um, actually had some peanut um, allergens mixed into their flour for, you know, 400 batches or something like that. So they had wow. to do an actual recall because of, because of another company. Um, and, you know, it, that kind of thing happens in the food industry all the time. Having a recall doesn't mean that you failed as a manufacturer. It means that you care about your consumers. And when something goes wrong, you can do something about it right away so that nobody gets hurt. That's really good information. And, you know, all the companies that we work with, almost all of them start with spreadsheets and spreadsheets, they're free. It's easy to collect data. But around this, there's also typically challenges with working with just spreadsheets, which is one data immutability. I mean, I type something and I fat finger things all the time and, and put a wrong number in or put a wrong letter in. So when you put in data in, is it correct and knowing if it's accurate? Also, connectivity is a significant challenge of just using spreadsheets, meaning, hey, I've got a spreadsheet with this supplier information and maybe this transaction, but how do I connect that to the right documentation or the right C of A? 
after it's transformed is a big challenge. How does it connect to inventory is tough. And thus, typically, we have to use a lot of different systems, which are fragmented, Dropbox for documentation, spreadsheets, accounting systems. And it's hard to connect everything. And therefore, workflows are also tough, which you may have one person that's doing procurement and may say, oh, we're out of this product. They're on the phone with a supplier. Can you provide us this? And they send it or you buy it without having gone through the right protocols from your quality assurance team or your head of operations that says, wait a second, we haven't checked their certifications or CFAs for this product to buy it. This is coming from a different facility. Therefore, we shouldn't be buying this additive from this company because it's not certified. And ultimately, where we're all headed is analytics. How do you measure data and information on systems that are fragmented? And that's ultimately why we recommend tying and integrating your whole system together. You guys are talking about so much information about GMPs and all the different components that are pulled around that. But having a system that can pull it all together is really important. So what we've developed actually is you know, being able to have clean data, what we call your master data for all your approved suppliers and their products that are approved and the documentation with those. And then also having ingredients and recipes and where a lot of our clients really struggle is, all right, we've got a recipe for, let's say, a specific CBD tincture. Maybe it has four ingredients in it, you know, a certain CBD percentage and some additives. But if you've got multiple suppliers and you blend those together, the lot numbers that went into them are different from the lot number that comes out. And therefore, it can get opaque as far as, oh, wait, we had a problem with this or it came out of, tested differently. Where did it come from again is, is a challenge. And that's something we help solve. And then ultimately that gets into having a recall and return system, which we'll get into in a moment. And then in the end, as you put in all these good practices you guys are talking about and tracking everything at every phase, now how do you convey to your buyer, whether it's a retail store or a consumer, that, listen, we have the C of A's, we have the track and traceability, we have all the documentation, and now you can put QR codes on your labels, which are required legally for CBD products in five states so everybody should really be having QR codes on your labels in order to manage that. So we've, we've created three different products. I won't get too much into it today, but Tag One Harvest, which is for the cultivators and farmers to capture information at the farm level and data at the farm level. That gets passed on to Tag One Enterprise, which really anybody in the CBD hemp space should have something like this, which is managing all your master data, all your documentation, tying it together having batch numbers um, pulled in, as well as a recall and return system. And then ultimately tag one connect, which is really important for those ingredient companies and brand companies that want to share their, their stories, the science, the C of A's, and their traceability to their consumers. And ultimately what comes out is our visual map, which was in tag one enterprise, which is my favorite feature because I'm the simple guy that likes pictures. But what we're able to convey to your internal supply chain operations staff or quality assurance staff is, all right, hey, we've got a product. What are all the ingredients that went into this product? And hey, who's our supplier? And then who's our supplier's supplier? And then where did this farm come from? And let me click on this and learn a little bit more about when this transaction took place and the documentation behind it. And all this gets very surgical. So in the event, you talked, uh, Kim, briefly about recalls and returns, if and when a recall and return happens, um, how important and helpful is it to have surgical information like this? And what, how can this help you avoid, as you mentioned, any and all return? And what's the impact of those type of returns? Yeah, so um, this, this happened a lot when I was uh, a regulator, unfortunately, because back in the day, um, you know, nobody, none of this was required. The track and trace wasn't required. I mean, just like I said, most places, especially in the CBD industry are widely unregulated when it comes to food safety and traceability. And um, when we would go into a place, we would, you know, they would be buying something from another grow from a grower. Um, and maybe it had, you know, pesticides that are not allowed on it. Well, they say this only, only this one crop that they bought was from that facility. Um, and you know, that's what tested hot, but mm. then we did some other stuff and it came back hot as well. And they couldn't 
tell us where any of that other stuff came from. In fact, they had no records at all of where they were buying things or where they were, you know, any of that. Um, and what was in each batch. And, you know, through metric, we kind of could get an idea, but it was still not, you know, it still looked like it could be anything in their facility. So when that happens, we do an any and all recall, um, which means anything that your company has ever made, um, all of it gets recalled from the beginning of when your company existed. So that's really, really devastating. I think the biggest one I personally ever did was a $4.2 million dollar recall. Um, and that that was actually, and that was just the stuff that we destroyed on site. That doesn't count for all the business that they lost in the future and all the stuff that maybe got sent back and had to be destroyed um, after I had left the facility. So, you know, th- these things can be devastating. That particular company is no longer in business. So we, wow. you know, it was really, it's really rough if you don't keep track of records. <laughs> That's brutal. You know, we often say in the military, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? I think, you know, listen, we're in early stages for hemp and CBD, and we feel like that, well, we need to beat the competition to the market, and we need to move really fast, but those kind of things can sink you. And I think now we're getting in the stages of working with big box retail, and they're going to require you have this information. They're just not going to work with you. So if you've rush to the market to get a product out, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get those deals and the people who have done it right are going to get those deals. That's really good information. So another, we've talked a lot about documentation. It's probably been, um, you know, 25% of our conversation today. So Sheila, when it comes to managing all this documentation, do you have any tips about, hey, should it be digital? Should it be printed? How do you store it? How do you organize it? Who should do this? What are your thoughts on managing all this documentation? Um, So what we have noticed with our clients is electronic or digital um, organization can be the best. That way you can always go back um, and, you know, look at your documents, update them easily rather than having a ton of printed documents to keep track of. Um, And not only that, but I think you should also have a backup system um, we are also saving all of your documentation on a backup system, um, you know, in the event of anything were to happen. And so I think that just because of the vast amount of documents that you're going to have with GMP and not only that, but all the logs you're going to have to maintain, I think that being able to keep them electronically is going to be your best bet for organization. Um, just because we've seen people lose paper documents so easy and have really struggle with how to organize them um, when you have that amount. That's awesome. So. In our system, of course, you can upload PDFs, and we also give our clients the ability to invite their, let's say, suppliers or buyers, and they can't see your system, but you can say, here's the information I need from you that we're going to approve or disapprove from you as a supplier, and then they can upload it, and it gets connected with them as your supplier. But something we did interesting really recently, because we've been hearing these challenges around C of A's, right? So C of A's, if you get it from either a third party approved tester or you receive it from your supplier, they're all different formats. There's no standard C of A format. So it's hard to pull data from that. And most companies, of course, are doing their own internal tests. So we created what we call an electronic C of A. So if you're doing your own internal test, you can actually put in the results from your test into the fields that you create. And from there, you can create a digital PDF C of A that you can both share, but probably more importantly is to be able to see trends over time. So let's say you get a PDF from a third party tester, you can type in the results from that and now you're starting to see trend analysis. Hey, wait a second, we're seeing THC levels for this um, cultivar increase over time or um, we're seeing pesticides increase over time from this supplier. We may need to give them a call or maybe do we need to look for another supplier? so that we can start to stay ahead of issues before they become a problem. Um, But of course, being able to share um, documentation is is certainly important. So so with that, um, that, uh, we're going to get into Q&A in just a second. Um, So Kim, what are just some final tips or thoughts you have for everyone today before we get into Q&A? Yeah, actually, I think Sheila, did you want to do this one? Yeah, absolutely. So this is just kind of a summary of like what all we had talked about. And so just some big takeaways from this whole webinar is first and foremost to do your research. And what we mean by that is your research for your suppliers, for your employees, for your equipment, 
um, you know, before you invest in any type in any type of, um, you know, third party manufacturer or anything like that, make sure that you guys really do your research. Um, document everything. We joke all the time with our clients that if you didn't document it, did it really happen? But mm -hmm. honestly, when it comes to GMP certification or even other certifications such as ISO, you really need to be documenting everything and have written proof of everything. Um, know how to write SOPs and update as necessary. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about SOPs in this webinar and it's important to know how to write them and it's important to be updating them as well. Your process is going to evolve and get better throughout your time um, manufacturing, but it's important to be updating those SOPs as your process evolves. Keep all documentation organized. Um, this is huge when you talk about the amount of documentation um, that is required for certain certifications, such as GMP. Organization of that is very, very important. Um, ensuring your staff is trained. So, you know, we talked a lot about employee training, whether that's safety of equipment, how to create the product, um, you know, general food safety, washing their hands is something that's very important, at, you know, right now when we talk about um, the coronavirus. So just general training of your employees is extremely important. Being able to have traceability, we have definitely talked about that, especially in the event of a recall. Um, integrate systems to simplify the process. So, you know, GMP can be overwhelming, especially when you're looking at it um, for the very first time and what is required. But there's several sim uh, systems out there and softwares you can use to help simplify your process and help you out. And then um, get help if you don't understand how to create an SOP or you don't understand, you know, what a GMP compliant facility looks like um, or what would be required, you know, you can always get help, whether that's through um, consultants or online trainings. Um, there's definitely a lot of people out there that want to help and want to see the industry succeed and want to see you succeed. And the last thing is to keep a positive attitude. And I think that this not only applies when it pertains to GMP, um, but also just in the industry as a whole that it can be overwhelming at times and, you know, it's changing all the time. And sometimes the list of things that are required or the things that you need to do just keeps getting longer and longer, but keep a positive attitude. And at the end of the day, remember the end goal that, you know, really we're providing a product to consumers that they want that's helping them. And we're really changing the world because um, we're at the forefront of this amazing industry and it's only going to grow from here. I, I totally agree. And I think one um, one kind of last final tip is look at the long game, right? Play the long game that we're just starting. We're really in the, in the first inning for this industry. We don't quite yet have any clinical data to show results of how this works. And so companies that are trying to rush to feel like they need to win today are most likely going to lose to companies that are thinking about, you know, two years down the line or five years down the line. So that was fantastic. So a couple quick questions for you. Um, and these are some that, that I had that I posed to you guys that you can answer. So quick question. If somebody wants to get certified, about how long does that take? What should they expect? Um, well, this actually kind of depends on the company. Um, you know, some, some companies have some things already in place that we can kind of go off of. Um, and I can only speak to, you know, our clients and how fast it is to get GMP certified when um, people hire us. Um, so I, I don't really know if you're trying to do it on your own, which, you know, if you have someone in house that has a really extensive food safety or GMP background, then, you know, I say go for it. Um, but it, I think the fastest we've ever gotten one done is in six months. Um, and they had a very high amount of billable hours per month, but they had the budget for it and just said, we want this now. So we started right away and they started with nothing. So they didn't have any um any documentation at all really we we created all of it for them so I mean, it depends um, most of our clients it takes about a year because their budget won't allow them to you know increase those billable hours so it really depends on the company and, and sheila we actually had somebody post a question uh through the system and they wanted to know do they need to get certified if they don't have any employees so the cert GMP certification is 100% optional. Um, it's something that is not required right now. And the reason why it's so popular is because, um, you know, as Kim mentioned, in this industry, there's a big gray area when it comes to regulation and a lack of regulation. And I think consumers really see that, especially when there's articles that come out all the time about, you know, people pulling product off the shelves and taking it to a lab to test it and finding out that there's 
less than half the amount of CBD than, you know, what's being advertised. And so I think that people really take this GMP certification and they get it as a marketing tool um, to show their consumers that they hold themselves to a higher standard than what's currently being required. And not only that, but, you know, getting GMP certified is really just helping prepare for when the FDA does implement regulations for the industry. Um, they're going to be based off of a lot of GMP guidelines. And so it's not required at this time by any means. Um, but it's something that companies are very interested right now. And I think at the very minimum that all companies should look into, you know, GMP standards and try to be compliant to those standards, whether they want to get certified or not. Yeah. Excellent. And it doesn't really matter how many employees you have. The GMP certification right now is for the facility itself. So okay. even if you're the only person and you're making tinctures or making edibles, if you don't have any other cons or any other, um, employees other than yourself, you're still making a product for the consumers. Um, and we, you know, we would recommend to get it anyway. Um, and then you would have everything on hand. So when you do start expanding and getting more employees, you know what to train them on. Excellent. So another question we had is, is it common practice to request a copy of GMP certification or additional, additional certifications such as vegan organic from your suppliers? Sheila, you want to take that one? Sorry, you cut out for a second. Could you repeat that real fast? Absolutely. Is it common practice to request a copy of GMP certification or additional certifications, such as vegan, organic, or otherwise, from your suppliers? Yes, absolutely. I think that, unfortunately, you cannot always take people's word when they say, yes, we are organic certified or GMP certified, that I think you should definitely request to to see their certification. And I understand sometimes people are worried that you're going to take their certification number and use it for themselves, um, but they can easily cover up that number and show you the certification or tell you where they're sort of like who they were certified from. And a lot of certifying bodies, if you say, you know what, we use this company and they certified us, you should be able to get on that company's website and look at their up-to-date certifications and see who is on there. That way, you know, it's legitimate. Um, but, you know, asking for a copy of that certification is very common. And I think that most people who have certifications um, are prepared for those type of questions and requests. Absolutely. I almost say it's, it's not only would be common, but should be best practices to do, like almost should be required. And, and, you know, there is a significant amount of organic fraud out there about companies who are claiming to be organic that aren't. So it's a good, I'm glad you mentioned that to go and look up to make sure that they are in fact organic certified. Because again, if you have the brand, you're, you're on the hook if you're claiming to be organic and in fact you aren't. But another good question we had is, um, Kim, I'll let you take this one. GMP okay. is only required for the manufacturing process or can they apply it to the whole company? Kind of like, and she says like an integrated management system like ISO 9000 or ISO 14000 or 18001. So this is kind of a, it kind of depends on which certifying body you go for um, or go with. They kind of all do it a little differently. Um, but many of the, the clients that we've had, you know, they're grow, you know, they're completely integrated. Um, and so, you know, their grow is on site and then they have a manufacturing facility and then they have a storefront somewhere else. Um, and yeah, so if you have ISO 9001, if you if it's all kind of integrated, then, yeah, it will count also towards your grow if it's at the same facility. Um, if it's separate, then you might have to get two separate ones. But like I said, it kind of depends on the certifying body. Um, right now, you can get um, GMP and ISO certification in cultivation facilities. Um, I think one of our certifying bodies actually allows that. But, it, you know, it, it really depends. If they're both on site, um, that is always helpful because then, you know, you only have to pay for the auditor to be there for one day because they can see the whole site in one day. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it just kind of depends. Excellent. And Sheila, so one of the questions we put on here, which is, can all cannabis facilities get GMP certified? And, and what about cultivations? Yeah. And so um, Kim touched on this a little bit, and it depends on your certifying body. So some certifying bodies will um, certify cultivations. Um, and others are only really focusing on the manufacturing level. And not only that, you need to be careful or really vet your certifying body because some certifying bodies are only doing certification for CBD or hemp products um, or facilities, and some will actually do both hemp and THC. Um, so you really need to just kind of ask those right questions and see. And I think because it's a new industry, and like Kim mentioned earlier, um, these certifications just started being um, recognized in 
really allowed for the cannabis industry. So each certifying body is kind of at different levels. Some certifying bodies will not certify a cannabis at all. So just kind of getting on a phone call with them and seeing where they stand. Um, but it is possible. And there are certifying bodies out there that will certify cultivations, THC facilities, hemp, um, that will do it all. Awesome. And Kim, any last thoughts on what that whole certification process looks like? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that's one of our biggest jobs is actually evaluating your company and figuring out which certifying body fits best with you. So that's kind of our first thing. So we work on retainer. So a lot of our clients will just hire us. And then that's kind of the first step is finding out, okay, which certifying body works best for your company? Which one do you guys like? Um, and we we work with three certifying bodies right now um, very regularly. So we really know, you know, what they require and what they're capable of doing. So we kind of find that out. And then from there, we get documentation going. That's the biggest chunk of, you know, what needs to be done because documentation, like I said, it the list is like the size of my leg um, of stuff you have to have. So we get that done. Um, once that whole phase is done, then we usually go back in and do another gap analysis to make sure that everything um, in your facility is now up to date and we kind of go from there. If we need to fix some things, we fix some things. If not, then we communicate with the certifying body and schedule the certifying audit. Um, within that time, you know, a lot of times we'll add training to that. A lot of people want to just train in-house. Um, some people will have us build trainings for them that they can do in-house or we will come on site and do trainings um, because the staff obviously has to be trained. Um, and then, yeah, we have the certifying body come in if, you know, a lot of times, in fact, 90, no, 100 percent of the time they're going to find something <laughs> that needs to be changed. That's what they do. Um, yeah. And then you essentially write a corrective action plan. Like these are the things they asked to change. This is how we're going to change them. And this is when we're going to change them by you submit that. And then usually they're really small things that aren't really a big deal. Um, and you get your certification for the full year. So it's, you know, it's a long process just because it takes so much time to put together the documentation and train and do all that. But once it's done, at least you have the basis. And then next year is going to be a lot easier. Excellent. So Kim and Sheila, this was outstanding. Um, tons of great information. Certainly encourage all of our listeners to email Kim or Sheila if you have further questions, if you're interested in learning about their consulting service. If you have questions for me or would like to receive a copy of the presentation, please send me an email directly or call me, joe.witty at tagone.com. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and just ask you guys all to stay healthy and safe, enjoy Netflix, do something productive, stay in shape as we continue to move on, and keep an eye out for future webinars. Kim and Sheila, thank you guys so much for your time. You guys are incredible and look forward to doing more great things together soon. Thank yeah, you. Thank